Good morning. If you would, grab a Bible. Let's turn to 3 John, 3 John, where we'll be centering our time and our attention in this part of our worship. 3 John, we'll begin reading there in verse 9. As you're turning over there, I want to welcome you and let you know that we're glad that you're here. We have a number of visitors with us. We have a lot of our people who are traveling to and fro this week with spring break. A lot of our college kids are out of town, uh, but we want you to know that we are appreciative of the fact that you've chosen to be here with us, and we want you to feel welcome. We want to help you to know the Lord, and we want to help you to know what we're doing here, why we care so much about following Jesus, singing these songs, studying the Word. Uh, we'd love to share our enthusiasm and our work with you, so please just stick around a little bit and let us get to know you, but thank you so much for being here with us this morning. I want to begin just by reading here in Third John verses 9 through 11. Only one chapter in Third John, so you don't have to dig around a lot. It's just right there on the front page. 3 John, verse 9, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. In this passage, John alerts us to the fact that there are people who can appear to be serving God, even can have positions of leadership or influence within the church, and yet be doing evil. And when those people do evil, it has consequences. It hurts people. In verse 10, it describes this man, Diotrephes, who is talking wicked nonsense and refuses to welcome the brothers and puts people out of the church. Sometimes. Our brothers have evil motives, and our brothers hurt and disappoint us. Sometimes we are hit by friendly fire. And that still happens today, just like it happened in the time of John and Diotrephes. Sometimes we have this experience when we gather together as the people of God. We come seeking compassion and understanding, and instead we find rejection and judgment from our brothers. Or we come seeking justice and we find instead denial. Or we come seeking peace and we find instead conflict. We come seeking unity and we find instead division. We come seeking sincerity and we find instead hypocrisy. And harsh words are often spoken in these situations. Harsh judgments are offered. Sometimes someone won't speak to us anymore. Sometimes we feel we just can't trust people anymore, can't depend on people, can't open up to people anymore. Sometimes our leaders let us down. Sometimes the tone of the church upsets us. Sometimes, like evidently happened with Gaius here, or Gaius, we end up leaving the group, because it does appear to me that Gaius is not no longer a part of this church. Sometimes we're not allowed to stay. Other times we remain with the church, but we remain in sort of a wounded, discouraged state. And no matter what the situation, when we experience that, we are scarred by it. It is damaging. It is hurtful. And so I want to talk about that for a few minutes this morning. Uh, We talked about how last week we're going to be uh, looking at a series of studies this month called What Do I Do When? Where I want to look at certain situations that I often find myself discussing with people who feel a certain way or are in a certain place. And I want to show you that there is biblical wisdom for living and that the things that we deal with, God has addressed, and that there are things that we can have advice for in what we do next when we're in certain situations. And part of my goal this month in talking about these things is so that we know if we are ever in a position like this, we're not the first, we're not alone, And sometimes that feeling can be so isolating and overwhelming. Like last week when we talked about life falling apart, that it can be something that makes us say, no one here understands me. And I want to normalize, in a sense, some of these feelings and describe them from Scripture. But then I also want to see what kind of advice the Bible has for situations like ours. So what we're going to talk about this morning is, what do I do when I'm discouraged by the church? What do I do when it is God's people that are discouraging me, not just the world? And again, I want to say, if you feel or have felt discouraged by the church, you are not the first. John writes to Gaius as someone who had a front row view of church trauma. 
And he is trying to tell Gaius, here is what you do to remain faithful to Jesus, even though other people are discouraging you. So the New Testament church had a lot of times where people hurt each other and disheartened each other and frustrated each other, just like we do. And there are wisdom passages in Scripture that acknowledge that reality without advocating all the actions we tend to resort to. So I want to ask the question, what should I do when I am discouraged by the church? And we're going to look primarily at Gaius and John's advice to Gaius this morning, but I want you to know there are other places in the New Testament that also describe similar situations. So what does the Bible say about this? The first thing I want to show you is that even if you are discouraged by the church, you can keep doing good. So we're going to talk more in a minute about Diotrephes and the exact nature of what he's doing, but I want you to know that 3 John is not a letter written to Diotrephes. It is a letter written to Gaius, who seems to be suffering as a result of Diotrephes' actions. And in the background of 3 John is a certain historical situation, which is that in the early church, evidently where these men are, a lot of traveling preachers were going around from place to place, and they were not supported by anyone. They relied on the hospitality of people who would take them in and feed them and take care of them. And so this created some issues in some of these churches. Look in verse 5 of 3 John. 3 John verse 5. John says, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do them well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. So John praises Gaius. He says, you're doing a faithful thing, verse 5, because you're doing these things for the brothers. In verse 6, he says, you will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. That word send in the New Testament context often implies more than just, you know, good luck, see you later, but implies giving them the things they need, giving them food or money to send them on their way, just like New Testament churches sent out men to go preach. You send them on their way. Gaius, you've done that. That's a faithful thing. Verse 7, for, he says, they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. I believe the reference there to accepting nothing from the Gentiles means they're not taking money from unbelievers. They're relying on you. They're relying on their Christian brothers. When they come, you need to help them because nobody else is helping them. And so you're doing a faithful thing. Verse 8, therefore, we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers for the truth. So you're doing what's right, Gaius. You're doing a faithful thing. Keep doing what you're doing. But Diotrephes doesn't think that way. Verse 9, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense about us, and not content with that. He refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. So Diotrephes has gained influence in the church. I have a lot of questions about this. You probably do too. That is, are Diotrephes and Gaius members of the same church? Is that what we're talking about? Is Diotrephes an elder or just an influential man? We just don't know that. But it doesn't significantly change the idea. No matter what you say about the situation, Diotrephes is controlling the church. And he is making his will the will of the church. And that has led, according to verse 10, to him refusing to welcome the brothers. And I hope you hear how that changes what Gaius is doing. Instead of Gaius just doing a nice thing for somebody in the context of a whole group of people doing nice things for people, he is actually doing it in direct opposition to Diotrephes, who refuses to welcome the brothers. And then also in verse 10, he stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Maybe we're even reading the mail that John wrote to Gaius when he heard he had been put out of the church for doing a good thing. You see, what Gaius is doing is in defiant reaction to Diotrephes and his stance. And John's message is simple. Keep doing right. You can still do good. Brother, it is a faithful thing you're doing. We ought to do this. This is right. This is good. This is healthy. So I want to say, just Put yourself in Gaius' shoes for a minute and think about how you would feel 
if you try to do a kind thing that probably cost you money and time and energy, and then the reward for your kindness and your good thing was that you got shunned by your brothers and sisters in Christ, how would you feel? Do you think you might be discouraged by the church? And so here, John says to Gaius, you're doing good, keep doing good. You're doing a faithful thing. You see, when our fellow disciples hurt us, it can be incredibly demotivating. If you've ever been in this position, you know what it feels like to feel just, I'm done. I don't want to mess with this anymore. Why would I sacrifice? Why would I keep putting myself out there when all I get is criticism and discouragement? I think of Mary. Remember Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who takes the expensive ointment and puts it on Jesus? And what she gets for the sacrifice of this very expensive gift just to honor Jesus is a a whole lot of criticism. They scorn her. They rebuke her. And they say, this is the disciples, I mean. They say, why was this wasted like this? It could have been sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. And it says they scolded her. And of course, Jesus rises to her defense and says, you leave her alone, she's done a good thing for me. But, but if you're Mary, and you know that when you do something really good, and you do it from good motives to honor Jesus, and all you get is criticism, how likely are you to do it again? What are you thinking the next time? You see, what happens to us is that when we are discouraged by our brothers and sisters, we stop doing good, or at least we're tempted to stop. And so when you feel discouraged by the church, I want to say with John, keep doing good. It's still good to do good, even if other people don't respect it or honor it the way they should. In fact, I am impressed by the way Paul handles his hurt. I asked Jared to read for us from 2 Timothy 4. It was an extended section, but I just want to bring out part of it. This is in verse 14 and 16 and 17, where he says, Alexander the coppersmith, did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. I, I, I don't know what exactly that was. We got a lot of Alexanders in the New Testament. I don't know if that's the Alexander the coppersmith that starts the riot in Acts 19. I don't know. I don't know. But here's what I know. Paul was wounded, and yet he says other things about other wounds. He, he'd already talked about Demas. He says here, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. I want you to hear how he's kind of cataloging. This happened and this happened and this happened. But but the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me and he will strengthen me and he will continue to be with me. People may come and go. People may hurt me, may do me great harm, may abandon me. But the Lord will be with me. And I want you to hear how Paul changes his focus, moving from one to the other, because he refuses to let other people's failures stop him from doing what he should. He needs to preach whether people are with him or not, whether people have done him great harm or not. He still has work to do for Jesus. I also want to caution us about this as we reach this point. This is in Romans 12 and verse 19, where Paul writes, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Think about that in context of what we just read. He has done me great harm. They all abandoned me. They forsook me. Never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And then Paul writes, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. When we people do wrong to us, it is very easy for us to choose to do wrong in return. I don't just mean that we, you know, punch back those who have punched us, but we might shout back and we might plot our retaliation. We might get icy cold to them or we might run them down to other people. But what's happening when we do that, when we respond to their evil in kind, is that we are overcome with evil. Their evil now becomes my evil. And so he says, Do not be overcome by evil. Don't let what other people do to you make you do wrong to others. Don't be infected by their evil. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Only 
when we refuse to take vengeance, can the escalation end. Only then can we let go. So when my brethren hurt me and disappoint me and frustrate me and judge me and intimidate me and accuse me and slander me, I can still do good. Keep doing good. Now, it seems to me that in these moments, I really need to turn my attention back to my work and my blessings and my opportunities. It seems to me that this is a time when I need to look outward and say, what other needs are there? What other ways can I serve people? Maybe it is that I need to do a little more doing than thinking for a little while. Because I have found personally that when I get to thinking too much and doing too little, that's when some of my problems start. So maybe I need to be at work doing good so that by my doing good, I can move past some of the evil that's been done to me. But if you're in this position and you were to sit with me and say, what should I do? I feel discouraged. I would say, whatever you do, don't stop doing the good you know to do. Second, call evil what it is. Call evil what it is. Look again in 3 John. I want you to notice how John doesn't shy away from speaking frankly about Diotrephes. Verse 9, 3 John and verse 9. I have written something to the church, he says, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So John's frustrated. He says, I tried to write something to the church, but all my efforts to try to help the church are stymied by Diotrephes, who refuses to accept his authority as an apostle. It's hard to help somebody when they don't think they should listen to you, right? And so he says, I'm trying, but I can't do anything. But it's not an innocent misunderstanding. He says in verse 9 that this stems from Diotrephes liking to put himself first. Some versions have he wants the preeminence. He wants to be in charge. That's who he is. That's what he's about. It's like the apostles who have that running argument throughout Jesus' ministry. Which one of us is the greatest? And they all want to be the greatest. Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? And everything is looked at in terms of power and influence. And so here is Diotrephes, who is duplicating that in the church. And John says, this is a heart problem. He likes to put himself first. Can I just say, before we move on from that verse, that it is a reminder to those of us who are in positions of leadership or influence within a local church, that we need to be extremely careful about the way we present our thoughts and opinions and enforce them on other people. Because it's a reminder, if our hearts are not right, we can do tremendous damage, like Diotrephes did. Verse 10, so if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. So John says, I'm going to confront him when I come about how he's slandering the apostles about how he refuses to listen to my letters and how he refuses to welcome the brothers. Those are good things, remember? So he says, there are bad things going on. Let's call them what they are. Verse 11, beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Huh, I wonder what he's talking about. It's the next verse. He says, do not imitate evil like what I just described, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So it is evil, even if it comes from someone that a lot of Christians respect, like Diotrephes. It is evil, even though it comes from someone who claims to be a disciple of Jesus. Evil is evil. And John is saying, let's call it what it is. Let's call evil, evil. Now, why does that matter? Why do I say this? Why does John point it out in this way? I believe it's because when we've been hurt, we have a really hard time being objective. So we have a hard time separating our hurt from what's actually evil. Have you noticed that you can't tell the difference when you've been hurt? That it just feels so bad when you've been hurt that it feels evil, even though, you know, from an objective standpoint, it's not. And so here's how John handles diatrophies. He has tangible, actual things he is doing that are wrong. He says he doesn't acknowledge our authority. He slanders us. He refuses to welcome the brothers. He stops those who want to, and he puts them out of the church. And all of those things are evil, all of them, along with sort of the general pattern and tone, also evil, 
and the desire behind it, wanting to put himself first, also evil. Evil, evil, evil. Do not imitate what is evil, but imitate what is good. We need to be able to label that's evil. I don't want to do that. I don't want to follow that. And we can't always do that when we're discouraged and hurt. So it helps to remember when you have suffered, sometimes people choose to do evil things. And this is what evil feels like. If you'll pardon an illustration from my life. I remember I was nine years old when I found out that my dad had committed adultery. And I remember distinctly some of the emotions that produced in me as a little boy. I remember when my dad stopped living in our house. I remember when my dad stopped going to church with us. I remember going to court for a custody decision. I remember going over to his house and how that began Thursdays and every other weekend that we would go to his house. And that hurt me. That time was very hurtful for me. And I felt all kinds of emotions, especially a lot of confusion. I did not know what was going on. But do you know what really helped me, and to this day, helps me about that whole situation? It's that everyone involved in that situation, everyone, acknowledged that what he had done was evil. Even he did. And so in those moments, I can say, and even in retrospect, I can say, this was not just my feelings getting away from me. It wasn't just that I was hurt. It wasn't just that our family had broken up. It was that this was an evil thing that he had chosen to do. So when we suffer at the hands of our brothers, that's what we need, the ability to distinguish between hurt feelings and evil. And evil is just still evil. Gaius, you're doing right. Diotrephes, you're doing evil. And the other reason I believe this is so important, and if you were sitting in my office talking to me about it, this is what I would say to you. Sometimes our church hurts can be so disheartening that we say something like this. You know, if this, if this is what it means to be a part of a church, no thanks. If that's what it looks like, I don't want any part of it. And when you've been through something like that, maybe you've even thought or said something like that. And I want to remind you, there is a difference between what we are doing as a group and our goals and aims and what sometimes happens when Christians choose to do evil to each other. You need to know that there is a difference between living together as a church and someone doing evil. Those are two different things. And when someone does evil, that evil needs to be addressed and repented of. But you need to know, let's just call evil what it is. And I will say, that knowing how to label evil actually confirms my faith and confidence in God. Because it said to me, even at a young age, that God knew evil hurt people long before I did. Long before I experienced it, both as a victim and as a perpetrator. And so we need to know that's why God says things are evil, and that's why they hurt so much. So let's call evil what it is. Third, let's find some good examples. Look at Third John verse 11. Third John verse 11, he says, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So he's talking about what you're imitating. Gaius is going to imitate somebody. He says, don't let it be Diotrephes, whatever you do. And you might say, well, why would that be? Why would anyone imitate Diotrephes? Well, the answer is, a lot of people evidently do. He has great influence in the church. That means people like and respect him. And so he says, no. Be careful. Be careful. Verse 12, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. So here's another man, Demetrius. He's a good example. We don't know anything about him, but this is pretty high praise, right? He says everybody talks good about him. You know he's good, and for good reasons. So John says you need to seek out someone like Demetrius and not someone like Diotrephes. So don't get locked into thinking about diatrophies. If you've ever been in a situation like what I'm describing, where you are discouraged by the church, can I ask, who are you thinking about when you think about the church? If you've ever been bullied by a diatrophies, who are you thinking about when you come in the doors? 
Who are you thinking about when you say, I don't think I want to go there anymore? Almost certainly, you're not thinking about all the good. All the people who through a life of quiet obedience have earned your respect. You're not thinking about them. You're thinking about the one. And you're letting them dominate your thinking. Here is someone who is worth following. Here is Demetrius. And he says, pay attention to him and don't imitate what's evil. So when we've been hurt, we need desperately to seek out the people who are kind and good and righteous and quietly faithful. I am not saying that we just need to never talk to that person that's hurt us again. We just need to try to get them out of our life. I'm saying instead, we need to seek out some good influences when we've been hurt and discouraged. Again, I point you to Paul. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. I just love this passage because I can almost hear Paul as he points out these two names, uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes. There's a story there. And as he says that, you know, almost like he's thinking, oh, but Onesiphorus, he was different. And it's as if his mind turns to the positive so that he could say, there was so much good in Onesiphorus. He refreshed me. He wasn't ashamed of my chains, not like the others. He did a kindness for me. And I want the Lord to bless him and his family. So there's a time to remember that even though some people hurt and disappoint us, that there are other people. Don't forget that there are other people. There are good people. Yes, you might find a hypocrite. But what about the sincere people? Yes, there are people who seek the preeminence. But what about those who are far more willing to follow and yield and submit? What about them? Do they not matter? There are people who hurt others. There are also people who help others. So the question is, which people will we follow? Who will we focus on? Who will we allow to determine the temperature of our spiritual life? So, in all of this, what I am saying, and what I believe John is saying, I believe the concern behind the letter, is that the negativity that attends to our church relationships can sometimes become all-consuming. It can wear us out. It can discourage us and demoralize us and bankrupt our faith. But there is another path, the path of learning from our pain and disappointment, the path of patiently growing and learning to forgive and let go, the path of maturity and growth, the path of learning in Jesus and not just learning from our wounds. The path of seeking to reform my heart instead of always looking at other people. Do not imitate evil, but imitate good. And the fourth thing is don't give up on your brothers. Don't give up on your brothers. As I prepared for this lesson, I looked through a number of difficult situations in New Testament times. I thought about how it must have felt to be one of those Greek-speaking widows that was neglected in the daily distribution. How would you feel? I thought about what it must have been like to be a Gentile Christian in Antioch, where Peter would eat with you and act like you were good friends, and then as soon as his Jewish friends came, he wouldn't have anything to do with you. How would it feel? I thought about how Paul and Barnabas must have felt after they had an argument over John Mark that was so strong that they couldn't be together anymore. I thought about how Paul remembered those who forsook him while he was in prison in his moment of greatest need, those who did him much harm. There was pain and disappointment in the church back then too, wasn't there? Not new. But it gives tremendous context. When you remember that, you remember that the words of the New Testament were not written in a vacuum. They were not put there just to put on Hallmark cards because they sound nice. There are words that these same people wrote about their experience and their goals in working together. Words like these, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul wrote that because he knew how hard it was 
to let go of stuff. And he says, this is who we are and what we do. We bear with one another in love. Or Colossians 3, where Paul writes, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Now you see the pain involved in those statements. I hope you hear it. This is a time when brotherly love is tested. This is a time when we have to learn to forgive or else. This is when we see whether that commitment we have to love our neighbor really means anything. You've heard me say before that the New Testament does not record anyone being encouraged to leave a church and go to another one or start a new one. That is just not the way New Testament Christians dealt with their problems. They did not do that. I'm not saying when I say that, that there are not times where we may need to leave a group. My point is, it should not just be a reflex reaction that because I'm disappointed or discouraged, I'm just going to go wipe the slate clean somewhere else. Because often the greatest growth comes when we insist on continuing with one another through the pain and working through the problem and forgiving and moving forward. Someone has to stand up and say, don't give up on your brothers. None of us is perfect. And what that means practically is in our imperfection, we're going to wound each other. We're going to discourage each other. But we're not together because we're all similar or because we all always do the right thing. We're together because we love and follow Jesus. That's God's dream. That he could call a people out of the world who would love and follow his son and become one together. That's God's dream. Don't give up on God's dream just because you're discouraged. But I have to say, I completely understand what it's like to be discouraged by the church. And don't worry, in the things I'm about to say, I'm not really talking about you guys. There are times when I'm discouraged by my brethren too. Sometimes it's long-standing problems that seem impossible to resolve. Sometimes it's attitudes that I butt my head up against time and time again. just doesn't seem to get any better. Sometimes it's harshness that my brothers have with new believers or weak Christians. And sometimes it gets overwhelming. I begin to wonder, am I doing the right thing? I understand. But I have to tell you, I refuse to give up on Jesus' people. I will not do it. And I want to encourage you. You're not alone. But this is worth doing because it's what God calls us to do and to be. Because along the way, we may find we grow into different people as a result of being together. So keep doing good. Call evil what it is. Seek good example. And don't give up on your brothers. Would you pray with me about it? Our God and Father, we thank you so much for your great love and your great wisdom. We thank you, Father, for bringing us together, for calling your people out of the world through the gospel of your Son, for saving us from our sins, for working in us through your Spirit. We're thankful, Father, that we have a group of brothers and sisters that we can meet together here, we can walk towards you together, we can grow together, and that we can spread your word in this place. But, Father, we acknowledge that sometimes we frustrate and dishearten each other. Sometimes we wound each other and sometimes we do wrong to each other. We pray, Father, for your patience with each other, that we can bear with one another in love. We pray, Father, for tender hearts, that we can learn to forgive each other. We pray, Father, for patience, for wisdom, as we try to figure out what we should do and how we should respond to one another. 
And we pray, Father, that all of us will be willing to grow, will be willing to change so that we're closer to your vision for us. I pray especially, Father, for those who may be present in our assembly today, who are down and discouraged, who are wounded. I pray that you will help them to heal, that you'll give them the strength that they lack. I pray that as brothers and sisters, we can build them up and encourage them. And through that action, Father, we can be Jesus to them. I pray that the work that we do here will continue to give glory to your name and that others will be drawn to you because of who we are and what we do. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Might be someone here this morning who needs to respond to the call of Jesus on your life. Jesus calls us to come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your soul. That call is still available to us. And we want to echo his invitation so that if you're ready to come to him this morning, we want to help you do that any way that we can. To turn away from your sins and put your faith in Jesus be baptized into Christ, have those sins washed away, to begin that walk where you take on his yoke and you become a follower of Jesus like we are. We'd love to help you do that. We'd just like you to come to the front and let us know about that. If you have something in your life that is a weight on you and you want us to pray with you about that or to help you in some way, just come on up to the front, tell us about it.